In Unit 1, Section 2, we're looking at the concept of isotopes. Now, if you look at the symbol for an isotope, it's very likely going to look something like this. Now, that letter P, of course, represents the symbol of the element. So that's one of the ways that we know that this is phosphorus. Now, the number on the bottom here, that represents the atomic number. And that represents the number of protons in an atom. Sometimes we use the abbreviation Z to, to talk about the atomic number. Now, this atomic number corresponds to the atomic number, that whole number on the periodic table for that element. That's another way that we know that this is phosphorus, because if you have a periodic table handy, you can perhaps have one, and you can see that the atomic number 15 also corresponds to phosphorus. So this number down here should match up with the elemental symbol. Now, the number on the top um, is the mass number. And that's the sum of the protons and the neutrons in an atom. That's going to identify the isotope. So if you have a question where it asks you how many neutrons there are, well, you're going to have to take the top number, this mass number, and subtract the bottom number. So this particular isotope would have 16 neutrons in it. Now, if the question ever asks how many electrons, well, as long as we have a neutral atom and it's not ionized, well, the number of protons should be equal to the number of electrons. So in this case, we would call this isotope phosphorus 31. That's just its name. We call it, use the the name of the element with a dash and then the mass number. So it's, it's phosphorus 31. If we were asked how many protons, well, the atomic number 15 will be that. The number of electrons, it's going to be the same as long as this atom is not ionized. So it's also 15 electrons. And like we said, neutrons, we have to subtract. So 31 minus 15 would be 16 neutrons. Now we can do some practice with this. If we have this isotope of strontium, uh, how many protons? Well, that number on the bottom, the atomic number tells us it's 38 protons. And electrons, it's the same, 38 electrons, because there's no evidence that this is ionized in any way. And then neutrons, well, we have to subtract 95 minus 38. So that looks to be about 57 neutrons. So we would call this isotope strontium 95 using the, the mass number to identify the isotope. Let's try this symbol right here. Once again, protons, the number on the bottom, it's 54. And then it's also 54 electrons. And to find neutrons, we have to subtract, don't we? So 132 minus 54 gets us the 78 neutrons. We'd call this xenon 132. That's the name of the isotope. Now, we have this one. We have plutonium here. Once again, 94 protons, 94 electrons, and subtract to get that number of neutrons, about 148 neutrons. So this is plutonium-242. So that's how you can figure out the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons uh, for any isotope, and of course, its, its name. Now, when we talk about isotopes, isotopes are essentially different varieties of an element. And they all have the same number of protons. Like in this case, we have isotopes of hydrogen. There are three isotopes of hydrogen that we know of. Uh, all three of them have one proton because that's what hydrogen is. Everything that's hydrogen has to have one proton and everything that has one proton has to be hydrogen. What's negotiable is the number of neutrons. So most atoms of hydrogen actually don't have any neutrons at all. And so we'd call that hydrogen one. Sometimes we call it protium. That's a, a, a different name for that isotope. Almost all, something like 99.989% of all hydrogen atoms are that isotope. But there's another isotope that has one neutron. We call that deuterium, or hydrogen-2. And it has about 0.011% of all the 
atoms of hydrogen that we know of in the world. And then there's a third isotope that's present in just a trace amount in nature. It's called tritium or hydrogen three, and it has one proton and two neutrons. So these are how the isotopes are different. They have different numbers of neutrons. Now, one important thing to know about these isotopes is that they have different masses, different abundances. Sometimes uh, a certain isotope might be radioactive while different isotopes of, of that element are not. But chemically speaking, they all behave exactly the same. And so if you took a cup of water that had uh, all deuterium in it instead of the regular hydrogen one, it would go down just the same as regular water. It might be a little bit heavier, you may or may not be able to tell, but it would have the same uh, chemical properties. All isotopes of an element behave the same chemically. Now, when we talk about average atomic mass, we, we might wonder how we get that number. Where does the 1.0079 come from? Well, it comes from a weighted average, an average mass of all the atoms of that element. Now let me show you how we calculate that. Let's say we have this problem right here, where the two main isotopes of hydrogen are protium and deuterium. Protium has an atomic mass of 1.0078 atomic mass units and represents 99.989% of hydrogen atoms. Deuterium has an atomic mass of 2.0141 AMU and represents 0.011% of hydrogen atoms. Calculate the average atomic mass of hydrogen. Well, what we do is we take each isotope's mass, so in, in this case, the first one, the 1.0078, and we multiply it by its percentage abundance converted to a decimal. So that's 0.99989, and we get a, a value there. And we do the same thing for the other isotope. So the other isotope is 2.0141, and we multiply that by 0 0.00011, and we get this very small number. Then you take those two products and add them together, and if you've done it correctly, you should get the same average atomic mass as you see on the periodic table, or at least something very, very close to it, and we do. So that's how you calculate the average atomic mass for an element. Now, sometimes you may have a problem like this, where it says that gallium has two main naturally occurring isotopes. Gallium-69 has a mass of 68.926 AMU and an abundance of 60.108%. What is the mass of gallium-71? So it looks like we have a puzzle basically here because we're not being asked what's the average atomic mass of the element, we're being asked to essentially work backwards and find the mass of one of the isotopes. You can set the problem up the same way. What I would do is I would start by, by writing down this number, the 69.723, and you might be wondering where in the world does that number come from? Because that's not in the problem. Well, that is, from the periodic table, that is the average atomic mass of, the, of that element from the table, 69.723. And then I'm gonna take this other isotope, the 68.926, and multiply it by its abundance, the 0 0.60108, and I get this number. And now I know that there should be some other number in here that I would have, so I'm gonna subtract. So I take the 69.723 minus 41.430, and I get 28.293. Now that number is going to be the product of the percentage abundance of the other isotope times its mass. So, so I'm slowly working backwards and getting back to that original number. Now, what is the percentage abundance of the other isotope? Well, it has to be 39.892%. Now, how did I get that number? Well, the problem says that we have two naturally occurring isotopes here. And if we have two isotopes 
and one is 60.108%, well, your 2% have to add up to 100, uh, don't they? So just subtract from 100, and that's how you get this other percent, or subtract from 1 in, the, in this case. So now we can divide. We just take the 28.293 and divide by 0.39892, and we should get the mass of the other isotope, which is about 70.925. Now, occasionally they do ask this type of problem on the AP exam. Uh, sometimes they don't, but this is a very good skill to be able to uh, calculate the mass of a missing isotope. Now, you might wonder, how do we get these numbers? How do we figure out the mass of an isotope? Because you can't really take an atom, an individual atom, and place it on a little teeny tiny scale and figure out its mass. That would be ridiculous. Well, we have an instrument that helps us to analyze the relative abundance of isotopes in a sample. This is how we get these values. This is called a mass spectrometer, or sometimes a mass spec for short. And if we take a super purified sample of zirconium and stick this into the mass spec, we can get a little graph here that shows us the analysis of zirconium. So we have the relative abundances here. It shows uh, each, each little bar on the graph represents a different isotope. And the height represents the relative abundance in percent. And then how far left and right it is shows the atomic mass of each isotope. So we can get some very valuable data out of this. So for example, if we were to ask how many isotopes of zirconium are represented on the graph, I hope that you could count that there are five little bars here. So that shows this that there are five isotopes here. And if the question was, which of the isotopes is the most abundant? Well, the one that has the, the tallest bar. So that would have to be zirconium-90. It's got something like maybe about 52% abundance there. And the least abundant would have to be the, the shortest bar. So that would be zirconium-96, something like maybe 2 or 3% would be there. If it says estimate the abundance of one of these isotopes, well, zirconium-92. Now, zirconium-92, of course, would have to be right here. You know, it's labeled. It's also right at the 92 mark there. What is the abundance? Well, it's between 10 and 20. It looks like it would be about maybe 17, 18%. So you should be able to answer questions like this by looking at a mass spectrometer graph. Now, let's say we have a question like this. This is a sample multiple choice question. And it says, which of the following elements has the mass spectrum represented here? And we have... We have this mass spec graph, and we have a choice of four elements. Now, you, you will need a periodic table in order to answer this question. You're going to have to eyeball basically the, the center of this. Where is the approximate weighted average of all this? We have a couple graphs that are you know taller and smaller than others, but it looks to me like the average is somewhere around 96. That's what I would say. So what I'm going to do is look at my periodic table and find an element that has an atomic mass that's very close to 96. And as I look on the table, I see that molybdenum is very close to that, 95.95. So I'm going to say the answer is choice B. Now, the only other answer that's even possibly reasonable is niobium in B. But if I look at the table... You know, it has an atomic mass of about 92.91, which that's not really in the center. As you eyeball this, try to get somewhere in the center of that weighted average. That's why molybdenum is the correct answer for this. Let's try one more multiple choice question. Let's imagine that we have two different ionic compounds that each contain only copper and chlorine. Both compounds are powders, one white and one brown. An elemental analysis is performed on each powder. Which of the following questions about the compounds is most likely to be answered by the results of the analysis? And we have different questions here. What is the density? What's the formula unit? What's the chemical reactivity? Which is more soluble? Well, 
if we're doing an elemental analysis, then what we'll be able to find out will be how many atoms of each element are in the compound. So that would be choice B. What's the formula unit? For these other things like density, reactivity, solubility, the best way to determine those things would be not with an elemental analysis, but rather by carrying out those, those actual uh, processes in the laboratory. My name is Jeremy Krug. I hope you've enjoyed this video and, and learned something from it. Please give me a thumbs up or even better, subscribe if you enjoy this, this content. And I hope you do very well on Unit 1, Section 2 of AP Chemistry.